discussing um, Jesus' most well-known teaching from Matthew 5 through 7, uh, and it's called the Sermon on the Mount, and, and Jesus' central, central message in all of Jesus' teaching, but certainly in this Sermon on, on the Mount, has been his invitation for each of us to, to choose to live in God's kingdom to choose to live in God's kingdom, his, his way of love. And you can do it today. You can do it today. That's the exciting part. We don't have to wait till a time by and by in the, in the future. We can, we can do it today. Jesus, we pray this all the time, don't we? Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done. And just to add a little paraphrase, your will be done down here as it is up there. You know, we want your kingdom to come here on earth. I, I was struck by one writer who, who kind of painted a picture of, of, of what the kingdom of God could be like. And he, and he, and he made it in, in, in terms that I think we can understand. He says, think about an average neighborhood or village. And imagine if one by one, if the citizens, its citizens started making decisions to bless one another with resources rather than hoard and fight over them. Imagine what it would be like if society at large considered vulner vulnerability or kindness to be the highest form of power and glory. It's a world where mutual love between citizens has made it impossible for evil to continue. Think about that. That's just a beautiful picture. So when we say living in the kingdom of God, um, that is a, a living in a relationship with Jesus Christ, with Jesus as king and his will be done. And that's actually the same thing. From the very beginning of, of the year, we've been using that phrase, practicing the presence of God or, or all of life, all for Jesus. All three of those are equal. They mean exactly the same, same thing. But, as I say, there are just different ways of saying the same thing. So last week, Pastor Bill described for us once again, he said, Jesus' teaching seemed very revolutionary at the time. Revolutionary because his words were contrary to the kingdoms that were existing at that time. There was a clash taking, taking place. You see, Rome was in charge from, from a political standpoint, and they enforced their kingdom with exorbitant taxes and brute force. And people in general don't react, to exorbitant, don't react well to exorbitant taxes and brute force, and certainly the Jews hated be un, being under Roman rule. But even their own religious leaders had a kingdom of sorts too. Theirs was most about looking good from the outside. It was about making sure others saw them when they were praying. They would pray and make spectacles on the street corner, Jesus said. Or when they gave their, their gifts, they, they gave their, their alms. They made sure that people saw them do that. And they liked, to, they liked the power that they, that they had gained over the years. Of, uh, and, and it was a very self-serving religious system. And Jesus told the re re religious leaders, he didn't have very good things to say several times to them. But one time he said, you are like whitewashed tombs. You are like a tomb that's been painted crystal white, he said. He said, all white and pretty on the outside, but dead bones on the inside. You're dead on the inside. So when Jesus delivered his sermon, his audience was, it says, the crowd. And the crowd was like 98% of the people. The Pharisees and the religious leaders and all these other po political parties made up a very small portion, but they had just, they were very loud and they had very, very strong, of a strong uh, leadership and opinions. And so the crowd who was there listening to Jesus was a crowd of mostly poor, hurting, anxious outcasts people who were been spiritually beat up by their religious leaders and people who had been physically intimidated by Rome. And they needed a, a deliverer. They were looking for a deliverer, someone who could offer them some hope. So to this group of people, the crowd that, that Jesus was addressing on that day, people who felt 
very unblessed, Jesus' first words were, no, you are blessed. I want to offer you hope. I want to offer you hope. So one of the ways that Jesus, Jesus said that they are blessed had to do with their relationships with each other. One of, the, one of the Beatitudes, one of the first things that he said was, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. Righteousness is one of those church words that, that we use all the, all the time. But really, you can just substitute the words right relationships. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for right relationships. Relationships where people live to bless one another. And he says, when you hunger and thirst for right relationships, he said, you will be satisfied. You see, it wasn't that, that Jesus wanted to destroy Rome, the political Rome, that is, uh, or immediately dethrone the religious leaders from, from their religious kingdom. Jesus knew that, honestly, politics and religion, high religion, are very weak. They're very weak. He teaches that his kind of life, his kind of freedom does not come from violence or it doesn't come from harming other people. It comes through his love, which is the most powerful force that there is on earth. That's why a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount, we will hear Jesus say these, these words. Maybe you know these words. He said, seek first the kingdom of God above all else. Seek first a right relationship with God. Seek work first to practice his presence in everything you do and live righteously, he said, and he will give you everything that you need. All that is good will be added. So the world in Jesus' day, and I think I can extrapolate and say the world in our day too, defines power as wealth and position. The powerful use their worldly power to, to elevate themselves at the expense of others, and that's somehow, sometimes how change takes place, not for the good. And Jesus told them, this is my plan for changing the world. Pastor Bill w went over these familiar words last, last week. He says, think of yourself as what? Salt. You are here to bring flavor to the world, to preserve the world. And, and, or think of yourselves, our favorite image is light. Think of yourselves as light. You are the light of the world. You are light of the desert. The light of Jesus shines on us and we reflect his love and his goodness to those around us. And last week we noted, when we're looking to find our way, a little bit of light changes everything, doesn't it? A little bit of light changes everything. So being salt and light is, is, is how Jesus says we bring the good news of his love to others. Now, here's the thing, though. If you were to have asked Jesus, are you a revolutionary, he would have said no. We've been talking about that the last couple of weeks. He says, I'm just simply emphasizing God's plan. That's always been. It's been forever. God chose Abraham and Sarah. Remember what he said to them? He said, I want to bless you, so what? You can be a blessing to the whole world. That's exactly what I'm talking about right now. It's not change. It's as Pastor Bill said, maybe this is a revolution of restoration. Maybe we can call it that. But God's plan had not changed. Jesus is not abolishing the laws of Moses or the prophets. In fact, in some ways, Matthew painted the picture as he described Jesus' sermon that he was, Jesus was kind of comparing himself to Moses. Moses received the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai, and now Jesus is explaining them more, more fully on another mount, on, from the Sermon on the Mount. And the original teachings, Jesus said, are not obsolete. They're not flawed. And Jesus is further explaining Maybe what God really had in mind. Jesus kind of had an inside track to what God really had in mind because he was God. He knew what God had in mind. And his explanations are, he says, are ful fulfilling the commandments. Or as one author put it, I love this phrase. He says, they are filling them full. They are filling them full. The commandments, filling them up full. 
So now, Jesus is going to use six different case studies to help us fill them full, to fill the commandments fuller, to help us really realize what it li- means to live in Jesus' kingdom. All six examples will start out with this phrase, you have heard it said. You have heard it said, and then Jesus will quote one of the commandments or one of the laws, and then Jesus will add his explanations to it. And my friends, he's not softballing this thing. He chooses some pretty controversial topics along the way. Murder, adultery, divorce, any controversy there in any, any, any of those things? Uh, and he's going to make some pretty provocative statements along the way, like uh, in one of the upcoming passages, he's going to tell us to cut off our hand or poke out our eyes if they call us to, cause us to sin. Or in another place, he's going to say, if somebody slaps you on the right cheek, well, turn your other cheek. I'm, I'm so grateful that Pastor Bill is going to be preaching on those passages <laughs> and offering clear explanations in these upcoming as to what they do. But today we get to look at the first one. We get to look at the first, the first one. So I'm going to read for, for you the first case study that, that Jesus gives us from Matthew chapter 5, verse 21. He says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now, as we sit there and hear that, there's, okay, nothing real controversial there. That, that kind of makes sense, but let's, let's, let's read on. It says, but I say to you, ooh, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, raka, which means you good for nothing, um, shall be answerable to the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Whoa, we got a a little deeper in there, didn't we? That's that's a little tougher to understand. Now quickly, I I, want to grab a couple words that are, were the very last two words of that passage and uh, the fiery hell part and and, and just explain what what that means. Fiery hell, actually, the word is not hell in, in the Greek. Uh, it, it's the word Gehenna. Uh, if you look in your Bibles, there's a footnote at the bottom that, 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 that says that. Uh, Gehenna is actually called the Valley of Hinnon, or actually it's called the Potter's Field. Uh, and it's a literal place, and it's, on, it, it's a valley on the southwest side outside the walls of Jerusalem. And it's a place where ancient, in, in ancient times, if you read in the Old Testament, uh, some evil Old Testament kings actually offered child sacrifices, and they did it on, at this particular place. And later, the valley became really like a garbage dump where fires burned all the time to, to consume the trash. And then, of course, we read in the book of Acts that Judas hanged himself in the potter's field. Uh, it, it, was, it was a place where he felt, re, felt utter remorse, utter, utter hopelessness. And so when Jesus spoke of Gehenna, he was using a visual image of how people suffered consequences from their destructive actions. It was a, a literal place. It, it was an image where, where, where just suffering took, took, took place. And so now let's go back to the beginning of it. Let's go back to the beginning of, of, of the case study. At first glance, as I said before, Jesus seems to be um, giving us one of the clearest commandments. Um, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. And of course, that comes from Exodus. And, and then the consequences. If you murder, you'll be liable to the court. And, you know, that's no surprise. But then the tougher part comes when he starts talking about anger. He seems to be saying that anger is the same as murder. Can that be? I mean, if you're angry with someone, he says you're also guilty before the court. Isn't that the same consequences that is in the murder passage? And if you call somebody raka, which is a Aramaic word, which, which means good for nothing. And actually, in, 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 in the Semitic languages, oftentimes the first letter 
of uh, it, this particular first word letter uh, is, is what's called a guttural sound. And it's like you would, it's the sound that you would make when you're about ready to spit on somebody. So it's a raka, like, 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 like that. And it's an, another way of saying, you are good for nothing, I just want to spit on you. And, and, and then he says, if you curse someone, that is you say you fool or you're stupid or something like that, you are in danger of Gehenna you've got some bad consequences coming. So let's talk about anger. Let's talk about anger. Anger, quite basic, is an emotional response that we have when our wills are restricted. Run up against something that I, I want to do this and I can't, and there's this little surge of energy that comes up in us. For example, um, let me give you a couple examples for me. When I'm signing up for something online and I need to prove that I'm not a robot. <laughs> and so I have to identify which of the nine pictures do not have a street light in them. <laughs> and I mean, do the poles count as street lights? I mean, I, I don't know. And I usually get it wrong. It's, it's not when, it's if. Uh, and it's not if, it's when. And, and then I have to do another set of boxes. Which of the boxes have a fly in them? You know, some, something really, really small. And, and I, I suddenly sense this burst of energy rising inside of me because my progress is being restricted for signing up with this app and I am angry at the app. Or another example. This, this would never happen, but you come to church and you're not able to make a left turn to get in. Uh, has that ever happened to you? <laughs> oh my goodness, I am angry with this construction project. Uh, so, uh, but honestly, those are anger, that's anger, but it's not, it, but it's directed at an app or a construction project. And, and here is the universal truth. In this world, you and I will be, have our will restricted often, often. That's just the way the life is. And that sense of energy that you experience is involuntary. It just comes naturally. I need to learn to deal with when I'm restricted. I need to put them into perspective. But alas, hmm, Sometimes I do not deal well with that energy. And I think that's what Jesus might be referring to here. For those of you who are English majors or know about grammar, the, the tense of the verb that Jesus uses is a present participle. So it's not angered. It's, it's, ang it's not just I am angry. It says I am being angry. I am being angry. It's an ongoing sort of thing. The word, I like one, John Ortberg writes, the word that he most uh, directly associates with this is the word rumination. Rumination takes place. Rumination is when I choose to allow anger, angry thoughts to circulate in my mind. Think about your clothes in the clothes dryer. Just circulating around and around and around. Uh, my initial anger response is not the problem. We can't stop that initial surge of energy, but ruminating is my choice. Rumination is my choice. When I ruminate, my thoughts often move into feeling ill will, not just for the situation, but for a person. It's not just that my progress has been restricted, but as I allow those thoughts to circulate in my mind, I begin to think, wow, that person making me do the boxes is stupid. Or the city engineer is a bad person for, for doing, restricting my left turning. And I'm allowing my anger to grow into something, into thinking bad, bad thoughts about people. And given certain circumstances and certain situations, it could even grow to wanting to harm them. That's the progression that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying that ruminating anger can move into verbal abuse, name-calling, even harming someone. These are simply symptoms of, though, 
how we value other people, or in this case, devalue them. Jesus' point, please hear this so strongly. Jesus' point is it's never okay not to will good for another person. Let me read that one more time. It's never okay not to will good for another person. Now, we pray for them to stop their destructive ways and get right with God for sure, and we don't want the evil to to continue. Um, My first thought, though, was when I heard, you shall not murder, um, I've never shot, strangled, poisoned, or stabbed anyone. I must be in the clear. I must be in the clear. But Jesus is saying, there may not be blood stains on your hands, but that doesn't mean that there's love in your heart. It doesn't mean that there's love in your heart. Verbally abusing someone, belittling them, telling stories about them, lying about them, categorizing them, these are ways of communicating to someone that their life doesn't matter. And in some ways it's saying, it's, it's communicating an attitude of, I'm better than you. you. In all these cases, Jesus is asking us to look at our heart. All six cases are going to be asking us to do a heart check. In Jesus' kingdom, he calls us not to simply reject murder, but to actively love the people around us with his help. Everyone is valuable, and any time we devalue someone, it's wrong. Even that person who hurt us badly, (laughs) even politicians. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No matter who it is, (laughs) every person is valuable. Every person, anytime we, and anytime we devalue someone, it's wrong. Every person is created in the image of God, and God created each person with amazing potential, and that's what we're praying for for each person, their God-created potential. Our call is to treat each person as an image bearer with our attitudes, with our motives, and with our thoughts. Jesus, before he was about ready to go to the cross, gave us that, that incredible passage when, we were, uh, when, when, when he was with the disciples at, at the Last Supper. And he said this, he says, love each other, Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, that feels very convicting to me, at least, maybe to you too. And some patches are particularly tough because you know that the devil's listening too to this whole thing. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that he's going to give you some practice this week. He's going to give you uh, the chance to ruminate, to ruminate, to let those thoughts of anger circulate and, and, and for you to, uh, uh, to go after somebody. And right now, we need to ask for God's guidance. We need to ask for God's help in advance because I guarantee you it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And it happens most to the people that are closest to us, doesn't it? It happens mostly there. When our closest relationships are full of harsh words, that's when we feel most disconnected, when we, when we feel uh, most broken in our lives. So what's God's desire? Well, it comes back to that first beatitude for us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Hunger and thirst for right relationships. As I said, this is hard. All six cases are going to be hard. Actually, they're going to be impossible. Impossible without God's help, without the Holy Spirit. But that's the first beatitude, isn't it? Isn't that the first thing Jesus said on the, on the Sermon on the, Mount, on the Mount? Just to paraphrase it, he says, we are most fortunate, we are most blessed when we realize that every day we need God's help. 
when we realize we can't do it on our own. But when it is our passionate desire for, for good for all people, for, for that each person is growing into who they were created to be, then we are practicing Jesus' presence. But I've got some growing to do. How about you? I've got some growing to do. Now, to get real practical, Jesus even gave us some action steps. He, he, he gave us some examples here about this. So let's, let's, let's read on. He says, then, Therefore, if you are offering your guilt at the altar, your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, you leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do it while you're still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. And truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. So what's the first one, first example he gives us? He says, he says suppose you're in worship. Suppose this morning you're here, and you realize there is someone who has something against you, or you have something against someone else. But you remember, basically what it's saying, you remember that there's a relationship in your life that's just not right right now. Jesus says, leave worship. Go and try to make it right. Jesus' words probably caught them off guard. Maybe they catch us off guard too because worship we think it's the most important activity that, that there is. It, it, at least that's what they thought in, in, in God's eyes. So to leave worship, to disrupt worship, was unthinkable. But they, and I think we, don't understand how much God values right relationships. Our relationships with God and with each other are, are at the heart of worship. Getting right with each other is true worship, my friends. That is true worship. All of life is all for Jesus. Remember that. Here's action step number two, he says. He says, Jesus encourages us to come to terms quickly with an accuser even before we enter the courtroom. He says, settle it personally rather than using the courts. Uh, works to get past whatever is the problem especially if it's just pride or stubbornness. He paints a picture that says that if you don't, there will be a high price paid, and it will be tough to ever repair that relationship again. Every person is made in the image of God. So let's treat everyone as image bearers. What's, what happens when we get it right? What's the end result? Well, to others... It's going to be a powerful witness. It's going to be a powerful witness with when the love of Christ flows through us and brings people together. That's the most powerful evidence of his power and life-changing ability in the world. It just is. And for us as individuals, I, I, I don't know uh, if, if, if you've got somebody in your mind that is, is you know that you're not right with, it's tough to pray. It's tough to pray. There's like an obstacle right there. It's awfully hard to feel connected with God to communicate closely when that mugshot keeps popping up in, in, our, in, our, in, in our minds. A broken relationship is a little bit like a ruptured appendix, isn't it? Uh, once those toxins get into the rest of the body, they can be deadly. So we need to get right before relationship bitterness toxins form what Scripture calls the hardness of the heart. When hardness sets in, reconciliation is, is, is much tougher. Much tougher. Maybe you've watched this happen in other people. Maybe there's someone towards whom your heart is growing hard this morning. I know situations where uh, a brother and sister have not spoken to each other for 40 years. 
That's a long time. Think of that. What a loss for them and for their family. Romans 12, 18 says it this way. He said, the Apostle Paul wrote, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. How do you do it? Well, I'm sure Dr. Phil has written about it, but I don't think that's necessarily a magic formula that's gonna be 100% successful. There are, there are different issues with different people and different hurts and different timing, but one thing I know for certain that I can control is that my attitude in which I go to that person, if I come into the room trying to intimidate or with a spirit that says, I'm right and you're wrong, always, period, no budging, then I can almost guarantee nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. But if God can melt your heart, and my heart, and quench our pride, and help us to understand that the relationship is most important. We can even walk away disagreeing with each other and still respect each other and begin that healing process. See, forgiveness is God and you working together. Don't let your pride get in the way. Don't let your pride get in the way of God's powerful testimony, of God's power in your life. But reconciliation is also a God thing, but it involves another person. Reconciliation could take longer. And quite frankly, you might not be successful because you can't control that. You can't control the other person. But you can still forgive you can still forgive and get rid of the bitterness in your own heart. God can help you with that. Humility and honest, honesty are, are vital for both forgiveness and reconciliation. And when our hearts are focused every day on all the gifts of God's love and the blessings that he has given us and every single day, then, then working out our human relationships takes on a brand new priority. So I just want to ask you a question this morning as we close. Is Jesus the king over your relationships? Is Jesus the king over your relationships? I, I, for me to answer that, I, I know that I need help. I need help with that. No more categorizing people. No more telling stories that make me look better than others. I need to pray for those that are attempting to run our country. I want to be a brighter light and a saltier salt so that others will see Jesus in me. That's the highest priority that there is. How about you? So, <laughs> If any of you need to get up right now, I'll understand. <laughs> it won't be disruptive. It's the highest priority that there is. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we want to just offer ourselves up. We want to pray first before we go into any conversation. And we want to go and we want to get right. We want all our life to be all for you, Jesus. And that includes our relationships. So give us the strength to forgive, to run away from bitterness, and, and, and to love each other quite simply as, as you have first loved us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.